Chapter 17 and 18, Keep Your Pants On. I'm doing much better at keeping pace with Mrs. Brooke at recess. She says, I don't look like I'm marching in step anymore, so it's much more natural. And, she says, that shows a lot of finesse. I smile until she says the next thing. Your dad is worried that you might not understand that Devin isn't alive. He tells me, you say, Devin says this or Devin does that, as if he's still alive. I do say that, but it doesn't mean I think he's still alive. He was alive when he said those things, though. Your dad said, you want Devin to take you shopping. Well, I do, but Devin can't take you shopping. Do you understand that? Yes, but he asked what I want. That's what I want. I know I can't have it. I see. When you're talking with your dad about Devin, you might want to make it clear that you understand he's now gone. Will that make dad happy? I think so, yes. Fine, I'll try. Mrs. Brooke smiles. You know what? You're starting to show empathy. I am? You feel for your dad. You know he's hurting and you want to make him happy. That's wonderful. I nod, even though I'm not sure I completely understand. She starts talking about friends again, but I stop her. I already made one, I tell her. In fact, I have seven little dwarf friends. She tilts her head, then shakes it. I'm talking about real people, Caitlin. Well, me too. They're first graders, I think. At least Michael is. She does her turtleneck jerk. Michael Schneider? I know. Does he wear a red Potomac Nationals baseball hat? He often does. Caitlin, do you remember the name of the teacher who was killed at the middle school? Of course, it was Mrs. Roberta L. Schneider. And then I think about Michael's last name. Oh, are they related? Mrs. Brooke nods. Michael's mother. I knew his mother was dead, but I didn't know she was shot like Devin. Is that why he was at the memorial service? Yes, I think all of us were at the memorial service. We're a small enough town that we're like one big family. But still, how odd for you two to find each other. It's not odd, I say. I'm a little kid. I'm at little kid recess now, remember? And he was crying the first time I saw him, so I was being nice to him. And he knew about Devin. He said I was a weirdo who's... The what? Mrs. Brooke jerks her neck again. He didn't really mean weirdo. He said he was sorry. He's nice, and so am I. So it's not odd for us to be friends. She smiles. You're right. I think you and Michael have a very important friendship. Me too. I'm glad this I have I'm glad I have stickers and gummy worms for him. When little kid recess starts, I give Michael more planet stickers and all the gummy worms in my pocket. Thanks. He looks at the worms. What are their names? I start to name them, but then I stop. You can name them. He grins, dangles the orange one in front of me and then the red. This is Henry and this is Mudge. Like in the book, I say. He nods. And these two green ones are Frog and Toad. Have you read those books? I have all of those books. Me too, he says. Hey, guess what? What? My teacher says we're getting fifth grade reading buddies. Will you be my buddy? I haven't heard anything about fifth grade reading buddies. I don't know if I'm doing it. Maybe they do it during first recess when I have Mrs. Brooke time. He shakes his head. Nope, it's at the end of the day. It starts Thursday. Oh, I wonder if Mrs. Johnson told us and I just wasn't listening. Sometimes that happens. A lot. Hey, guess what, Michael says. It's Tyler's birthday. We got cookies with gummy bears on them. Lucky. And he's having a skating party on Saturday. What kind of party are you, are you having? What? You said your birthday is next month. It is. So what kind of party are you having? I don't have parties. Oh, well, what do you do? I go to the mall with my brother. His Bambi eyes open wide and he doesn't say anything for a few seconds. Isn't your brother dead? Yes, but I still want to do it. <clears throat> he nods slowly. I know. I still want to do stuff with my mom, too. I feel glowy and warm because Michael gets it. My dad doesn't get it, I tell him. <clears throat> my dad doesn't get it either. Does he still want to play football? Michael sighs. All the time. He must really love football. Yeah, I don't think he's very good at it, though. Why not? 
I heard my grandmother say that he's keeping his head up, but pretty soon he's going to crash and burn. I turn and look at the person. You mean in a car accident? Michael looks at the person, too. No, it means he's going to be really bad at something. My grandmother says that kind of stuff all the time. She says, shake a leg when she wants you to hurry and perk up your ears, when she wants you to listen and be a doll when she wants you to get her a glass of iced tea. I can't help giggling. I try to picture a doll holding a glass of iced tea. Michael laughs, too. <clears throat> Want to know my favorite thing, she says? When she wants you to be patient, she says, keep your pants on. I laugh, too. Why would you take your pants off? I don't know, he howls. And we both end up giggling until the bell rings. When I get home, I remember what Mrs. Brooks said about Dad and Devin, and I have a plan to make everything okay. I sit on the sofa and start talking about Devin a lot, except I don't call him Devin anymore. I call him Devin who is dead. I say it until Dad asks me to stop. But that's his name. No, his name is Devin. No, his name was Devin. Now it's Devin who is dead. That's different from the other Devin. That Devin was alive, and you thought I was confused, but I'm not because I know that Devin is dead, and that's why I'm calling him Devin who is dead, so you'll get used to it. No, I won't. I feel like crying every time you say it. Even if I say it 50 times? Yes. Even a 100 times? Yes. Even a 1,000 times? Caitlin, I get upset even thinking about it, so I'll definitely feel like crying every time you say it. I'm only saying it because you're upset that I think Devin is still alive, so I'm showing you I get it that Devin is dead. Dad shakes his head and leaves the living room. I stare at the chest and wish for the millionth time that Devin were here because even when I try to get it, I still don't get it. Chapter 18, A Plan for Healing Michael is right. We are doing reading, buddies. When my class walks into the library, Michael's class is already sitting in a circle on the floor, crisscross applesauce. We open and close our hands three times to each other. It's our special wave. He's grinning so much it reminds me to smile. Mrs. Brooke is there, too, and she's also smiling. Hi, Caitlin. I start shaking my hands. It's not Mrs. Brooke time yet. I have to read to Michael. Her smile goes away, too. Actually, we're pairing Michael and Josh up. I look at the person. Why? He's evil! Josh stands up and stares at me. He blinks fast and sits down. Shh, Caitlin, Mrs. Brooke whispers. That's not nice. I wasn't talking about Michael, I tell her. I realize that, she's still whispering. You are making a mistake. We're, she smiles, we're working on closure here. I look around the room. Where is it? Because that's what I'm working on and I'd like to see it. She takes me out into the hall and explains that Josh is going through a lot right now too, just like Michael and me, and that Josh needs to see that not everyone's mad at him, and Michael needs to see that Josh can be a very nice boy. I call it a plan for healing, she says. I look at the person. A plan for hearing healing is a stupid plan because Josh cannot be a very nice boy. Haven't you seen him push people off the monkey bars? Do you know what he says to people? I do, and none of that is okay, but he has been getting counseling too, and we're working through his hurts so he can get to closure. What about me? I'm the one who wants closure. Part of your plan for healing is to make friends, right? I am making friends, and now you're giving him to Josh. You can both be friends with the same person. She doesn't get it. Michael is my friend. I want to be the one who reads to him. You can read to him during recess or other times, but for our once-a-week reading buddies, it's going to be Josh and Michael. The rest of our stupid reading buddies' time is a blur. I know I read really loud so Michael can hear me reading to him, even though I'm at the other end of the library. I know that the, stu the stupid little girl I'm reading to starts crying because she says, I'm yelling at her, which I'm not. If the book says stop, then that's how you should read it, especially if Michael is sitting next to Josh, and especially if Josh is giving Michael a high five, and especially if Michael and Josh are giggling together. And I know Mrs. Brooke takes me out of the library early, but not before I see Michael looking at me with his big Bambi eyes and giving me our special wave. At home, I go to my hidey hole in Devin's room. I take his piece of, I take his piece of notebook paper with me the one that says Eagle Scout Project, 
the one with the list of supplies for his chest, the one that says, he's going to teach me. I stare at the list, trying to find closure. I keep hoping that somehow the devinness of the list will give me the answer, but it doesn't. I look up at Devin's carving of Scout and wonder if I can still be Scout if the person who called me Scout is now gone. I still want to be Scout for him. Devin said, if you want to be a Scout, you have to work at it. I know he was talking about Boy Scouts and Eagle Scouts, but he also said that about anything I had to do. You have to work you have to work at it, Scout. I know, I told him, because he said it a lot, 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 and sometimes I don't want to hear the same thing over and over and over, especially if it's hard. And work at it is very hard. I work at it all the time. My whole day is work at it. Sometimes I don't want to work at it anymore. Like when I finally get my own friend and Mrs. Brooke takes him away from me. It's just too hard. It's not fair. I hear Dad calling my name, but I don't want to come out of my hidey hole. I'm busy stuffed animaling the carving of Scout. It's warm and soft and quiet and safe in here, and I don't have to work at it. I think I'm staying here. I th I'm thinking about staying here, living here forever. Finally, when Dad says, answer me, please, Caitlin, I answer because he asked nicely. The door opens. Caitlin, his voice sounds funny. Are you in here? I'm under the dresser. What are you doing in here? Thinking. Thinking about what? Thinking I'm going to stay here and make this my room now? Oh, why? I was always, it was always supposed to be mine. I asked Devin if I could have it. He's quiet for a minute. Then he takes a deep breath. When Devin was gone to college. He is gone! I hear the squishy breath sound of Devin's mattress squishing. But he's not just gone to college. He's gone forever. I don't tell Dad that I didn't ask Devin if I could have his room when he was gone. I asked him in a different way, and Devin said it was a weird way, and I shouldn't say it like that, and I asked why. He said people would get upset. I don't want Dad to get upset, so I don't say what I really said. Can I have your room when you're dead? I think maybe I understand what Devin meant, because now I have a recess feeling in my stomach. I slide out from my hidey hole and crawl past Dad's shoes to my room. I get a clean piece of paper and make a sign. It says, Devin's room. And I draw Devin's eyes in the top left corner. In the top right corner, I draw his mouth with his lips curled up to show he's happy. I draw his crooked nose in the bottom left corner. His chest is in the bottom right corner. It's still not finished, and I guess it never will be.